The Witch Doctor Seeks Vengeance by Edgar Rice Burroughs Narrated by Peter Silverley Lord Greystoke was hunting, or, to be more accurate, he was shooting pheasants at Champston Heading. Lord Greystoke was immaculately and appropriately garbed. To the minutest detail he was vogue. To be sure, he was among the forward guns, not being considered a sporting shot, but what he lacked in skill he more than made up in appearance. At the end of the day he would, doubtless, have many birds to his credit, since he had two guns and a smart loader, many more birds than he could eat in a year, even if he had been hungry, which he was not, having but just arisen from the breakfast table. The beaters, there were twenty-three of them in white smocks, had but just driven the birds into a patch of gorse, and were now circling to the opposite side that they might drive down toward the guns. Lord Greystoke was quite as excited as he ever permitted himself to become. There was an exhilaration in the sport that would not be denied. He felt his blood tingling through his veins as the beaters approached closer and closer to the birds. In a vague and stupid sort of way, Lord Greystoke felt, as he always felt upon such occasions, that he was experiencing a sensation somewhat akin to a reversion to a prehistoric type that the blood of an ancient forebear was coursing hot through him, a hairy, half-naked forebear who had lived by the hunt. And far away in a matted equatorial jungle, another Lord Greystoke, the real Lord Greystoke, hunted. By the standards which he knew, he too was vogue, utterly vogue, as was the primal ancestor before the first eviction. The day being sultry, the leopard-skin had been left behind. The real Lord Greystoke had not two guns, to be sure, nor even one, neither did he have a smart loader, but he possessed something infinitely more efficacious than guns or loaders or even twenty-three beaters in white smocks. He possessed an appetite, an uncanny woodcraft, and muscles that were as steel springs. Later that day in England, a Lord Greystoke ate bountifully of things he had not killed, and he drank other things which were uncorked to the accompaniment of much noise. He patted his lips with snowy linen to remove the faint traces of his repast, quite ignorant of the fact that he was an impostor and that the rightful owner of his noble title was even then finishing his own dinner in far-off Africa. He was not using snowy linen, though. Instead, he drew the back of a brown forearm and hand across his mouth and wiped his bloody fingers upon his thighs. Then he moved slowly through the jungle to the drinking place where, upon all fours, he drank as drank his fellows, the other beasts of the jungle. As he quenched his thirst, another denizen of the gloomy forest approached the stream along the path behind him. It was Numa, the lion, tawny of body and black of mane, scowling and sinister, rumbling out low, coughing roars. Tarzan of the apes heard him long before he came within sight, but the ape-man went on with his drinking until he had had his fill. Then he arose, slowly, with the easy grace of a creature of the wilds and all the quiet dignity that was his birthright. Numa halted as he saw the man standing at the very spot where the king would drink. His jaws were parted and his cruel eyes gleamed. He growled and advanced slowly. The man growled too, backing slowly to one side and watching not the lion's face but its tail. Should that commence to move from side to side in quick nervous jerks, it would be well to be upon the alert, and should it rise suddenly erect, straight and stiff, then one might prepare to fight or flee, but it did neither. So Tarzan merely backed away, and the lion came down and drank scarce fifty feet from where the man stood. 
Tomorrow they might be at one another's throats, but today there existed one of those strange and inexplicable truces which so often are seen among the savage ones of the jungle. Before Numa had finished drinking, Tarzan had returned into the forest and was swinging away in the direction of the village of Mbonga, the black chief. It had been at least a moon since the ape-man had called upon the Gomangani. Not since he had restored little Tebow to his grief-stricken mother had the whim seized him to do so. The incident of the adopted Baloo was a closed one to Tarzan. He had sought to find something upon which to lavish such an affection as Tika lavished upon her Baloo, but a short experience of the little black boy had made it quite plain to the ape-man that no such sentiment could exist between them. The fact that he had, for a time, treated the little black as he might have treated a real Baloo of his own had in no way altered the vengeful sentiments with which he considered the murderers of Kala. The Gomangani were his deadly enemies, nor could they ever be aught else. Today he looked forward to some slight relief from the monotony of his existence in such excitement as he might derive from baiting the blacks. It was not yet dark when he reached the village and took his place in the great tree overhanging the palisade. From beneath came a great wailing out of the depths of a nearby hut. The noise fell disagreeably upon Tarzan's ears. It jarred and grated. He did not like it, so he decided to go away for a while in the hopes that it might cease. But though he was gone for a couple of hours, the wailing still continued when he returned. With the intention of putting a violent termination to the annoying sound, Tarzan slipped silently from the tree into the shadows beneath. Creeping stealthily and keeping well in the cover of the other huts, he approached that from which rose the sounds of lamentation. A fire burned brightly before the doorway as it did before other doorways in the village. A few females squatted about, occasionally adding their own mournful howlings to those of the master artist within. The ape-man smiled a slow smile as he thought of the consternation which would follow the quick leap that would carry him among the females and into the full light of the fire. And then he would dart into the hut during the excitement, throttle the chief screamer, and be gone into the jungle before the blacks could gather their scattered nerves for an assault. Many times had Tarzan behaved similarly in the village of Mbonga, the chief. His mysterious and unexpected appearance always filled the breasts of the poor, superstitious blacks with a panic of terror. Never, it seemed, could they accustom themselves to the sight of him. It was this terror which lent the adventures the spice of interest and amusement which the human mind of the ape-man craved. Merely to kill was not in itself sufficient. Accustomed to the sight of death, Tarzan found no great pleasure in it. Long since had he avenged the death of Kala, but in the accomplishment of it he had learned the excitement and the pleasure to be derived from the baiting of the blacks. Of this he never tired. It was just as he was about to spring forward with a savage roar that a figure appeared in the doorway of the hut. It was the figure of the whaler whom he had come to still, the figure of a young woman with a wooden skewer through the split septum of her nose, with a heavy metal ornament depending from her lower lip, which it had dragged down to hideous and repulsive deformity, with strange tattooing upon forehead, cheeks and breasts, and a wonderful coiffure built up with mud and wire. A sudden flare of the fire threw the grotesque figure into high relief, and Tarzan recognized her as Momaya, the mother of Tibo. The fire also threw out a fitful flame which carried to the shadows where Tarzan lurked, picking out his light brown body from the surrounding darkness. Momaya saw him and knew him. With a cry, she leapt forward and Tarzan came to meet her. The other women turning saw him too, but they did not come toward him. Instead, they rose as one, shrieked as one, fled as one. Mamaya threw herself at Tarzan's feet, raising supplicating hands toward him and pouring forth from her mutilated lips a perfect cataract of words 
not one of which the ape-man comprehended. For a moment he looked down upon the upturned frightful face of the woman. He had come to slay, but that overwhelming torrent of speech filled him with consternation and with awe. He glanced about him apprehensively, then back at the woman. A revulsion of feeling seized him. He could not kill little Thibault's mother, nor could he stand and face this verbal geezer. With a quick gesture of impatience at the spoiling of his evening's entertainment, he wheeled and leapt away into the darkness. A moment later he was swinging through the black jungle night, the cries and lamentations of Mamaya growing fainter in the distance. It was with a sigh of relief that he finally reached a point from which he could no longer hear them, and finding a comfortable crotch high among the trees, composed himself for a night of dreamless slumber, while a prowling lion moaned and coughed beneath him, and in far-off England the other Lord Greystoke, with the assistance of a valet, disrobed and crawled between spotless sheets, swearing irritably as a cat meowed beneath his window. As Tarzan followed the fresh spoor of Horta the boar the following morning, he came upon the tracks of two Gomangani, a large one and a small one. The ape-man, accustomed as he was to questioning closely all that fell to his perceptions, paused to read the story written in the soft mud of the game-trail. You or I would have seen little of interest there, even if, by chance, we could have seen aught. Perhaps had one been there to point them out to us, we might have noted indentations in the mud, but there were countless indentations, one overlapping another into a confusion that would have been entirely meaningless to us. To Tarzan each told its own story. Tantor, the elephant, had passed that way as recently as three suns since. Numa had hunted here the night just gone, and Horta, the boar, had walked slowly along the trail within an hour. But what held Tarzan's attention was the spore tale of the Gomangani. It told him that the day before an old man had gone toward the north in company with a little boy, and that with them had been two hyenas. Tarzan scratched his head in puzzled incredulity. He could see by the overlapping of the footprints that the beasts had not been following the two, for sometimes one was ahead of them and one behind, and again both were in advance or both were in the rear. It was very strange and quite inexplicable, especially where the spore showed where the hyenas in the wider portions of the path had walked, one on either side of the human pair quite close to them. Then Tarzan read in the spore of the smallest Gomangani a shrinking terror of the beast that brushed his side, but in that of the old man was no sign of fear. At first Tarzan had been solely occupied by the remarkable juxtaposition of the spore of Dango and Gomangani, but now his keen eyes caught something in the spore of the little Gomangani which brought him to a sudden stop. It was as though, finding a letter in the road, you suddenly had discovered in it the familiar handwriting of a friend. Gobu Balu, exclaimed the ape-man, and at once memory flashed upon the screen of recollection the supplicating attitude of Mamaya as she had hurled herself before him in the village of Mbonga the night before. Instantly all was explained. The wailing and lamentation, the pleading of the black mother, the sympathetic howling of the shes about the fire. Little Gobu Balu had been stolen again, and this time by another than Tarzan. Doubtless the mother had thought that he was again in the power of Tarzan of the apes, and she had been beseeching him to return her Balu to her. Yes, it was all quite plain now, but who could have stolen Gobu Balu this time? Tarzan wondered, and he wondered, too, about the presence of Dango. He would investigate. The spore was a day old, and it ran toward the north. Tarzan set out to follow it. In places it was totally obliterated by the passage of many beasts, and where the way was rocky even Tarzan of the apes was almost baffled. 
but there was still the faint defluvium which clung to the human spore, appreciable only to such highly trained perceptive powers as were Tarzan's. It had all happened to little Tebow very suddenly and unexpectedly, within the brief span of two sons. First had come Bukowai, the witch doctor, Bukowai, the unclean, with the ragged bit of flesh which still clung to his rotting face. He had come alone and by day to the place at the river where Mamaya went daily to wash her body and that of Tebow, her little boy. He had stepped out from behind a great bush quite close to Mamaya, frightening little Tebow so that he ran screaming to his mother's protecting arms. But Mamaya, though startled, had wheeled to face the fearsome thing with all the savage ferocity of a she-tiger at bay. When she saw who it was, she breathed a sigh of partial relief, though she still clung tightly to Tebow. "'I have come,' said Bukawai, without preliminary, "'for the three fat goats, the new sleeping mat, and the bit of copper wire as long as a tall man's arm.' "'I have no goats for you,' snapped Mamaya, "'nor a sleeping mat, nor any wire. Your medicine was never made.' The white jungle god gave me back my Tebow. You had nothing to do with it. But I did, mumbled Bukawai through his fleshless jaws. It was I who commanded the white jungle god to give back your Tebow. Mamaya laughed in his face. Speaker of lies, she cried. Go back to your foul den and your hyenas. Go back and hide your stinking face in the belly of the mountain, lest the sun, seeing it, cover his face with a black cloud. I have come, reiterated Bukowai, for the three fat goats, the new sleeping mat, and the bit of copper wire the length of a tall man's arm, which you were to pay me for the return of your Tebo. It was to be the length of a man's forearm, corrected Mamaya, but you shall have nothing, old thief. You would not make medicine until I had brought the payment in advance, and when I was returning to my village, the great white jungle god gave me back my Tebow, gave him to me out of the jaws of Numa. His medicine is true medicine. Yours is the weak medicine of an old man with a hole in his face. I have come, repeated Bukawai patiently, for the three fat... But Mamaya had not waited to hear more of what she already knew by heart. Clasping Tebow close to her side, she was hurrying away toward the palisaded village of Mbonga the chief. And the next day, when Mamaya was working in the plantain field with others of the women of the tribe, and little Tebow had been playing at the edge of the jungle, casting a small spear in anticipation of the distant day when he should be a full-fledged warrior, Bukawai had come again. Tebow had seen a squirrel scampering up the bole of a great tree. His childish mind had transformed it into the menacing figure of a hostile warrior. Little Tebow had raised his tiny spear, his heart filled with the savage bloodlust of his race, as he pictured the night's orgy when he should dance about the corpse of his human kill as the women of his tribe prepared the meat for the feast to follow. But when he cast the spear, he missed both squirrel and tree, losing his missile far among the tangled undergrowth of the jungle. However, it could be but a few steps within the forbidden labyrinth. The women were all about in the field. There were warriors on guard within easy hail, and so little Tebow boldly ventured into the dark place. Just behind the screen of creepers and matted foliage lurked three horrid figures. An old, old man, black as the pit, with a face half eaten away by leprosy, his sharp filed teeth, the teeth of a cannibal showing yellow and repulsive through the great gaping hole where his mouth and nose had been, and beside him, equally hideous, stood two powerful hyenas, carrion-eaters consorting with carrion. Thibaut did not see them until head down he had forced his way through the thickly growing vines in search of his little spear, and then it was too late. As he looked up into the face of Bukowai, the old witch-doctor seized him, muffling his screams with a palm across his mouth. Tebow struggled futilely. A moment later he was being hustled away through the dark and terrible jungle, the frightful old man still muffling his screams, 
and the two hideous hyenas pacing now on either side, now before, now behind, always prowling, always growling, snapping, snarling, or, worst of all, laughing hideously. To little Tibo, who within his brief existence had passed through such experiences as were given to few to pass through in a lifetime, the northward journey was a nightmare of terror. He thought now of the time that he had been with the great white jungle god, and he prayed with all his little soul that he might be back again with the white-skinned giant who consorted with the hairy tree-men. Terror-stricken he had been then, but his surroundings had been nothing by comparison with those which he now endured. The old man seldom addressed Thibault, though he kept up an almost continuous mumbling throughout the long day. Thibault caught repeated references to fat goats, sleeping mats, and pieces of copper wire. Ten fat goats, ten fat goats, the old negro would croon over and over again. By this little Thibault guessed that the price of his ransom had risen. Ten fat goats! Where would his mother get ten fat goats, or thin ones either, for that matter, to buy back just a poor little boy? Umbonga would never let her have them, and Thibault knew that his father never had owned more than three goats at the same time in all his life. Ten fat goats, Thibault sniffled. The putrid old man would kill him and eat him, for the goats would never be forthcoming. Bukawai would throw his bones to the hyenas. The little black boy shuddered and became so weak that he almost fell in his tracks. Bukawai cuffed him on an ear and jerked him along. After what seemed an eternity to Thibault, they arrived at the mouth of a cave between two rocky hills. The opening was low and narrow. A few saplings bound together with strips of rawhide closed it against stray beasts. Bukawai removed the primitive door and pushed Thibault within. The hyenas, snarling, rushed past him and were lost to view in the blackness of the interior. Bukawai replaced the saplings and, seizing Thibault roughly by the arm, dragged him along a narrow, rocky passage. The floor was comparatively smooth, for the dirt which lay thick upon it had been trodden and tramped by many feet until few inequalities remained. The passage was tortuous, and as it was very dark and the walls rough and rocky, Thibault was scratched and bruised from the many bumps he received. Bukawai walked as rapidly through the winding gallery as one would traverse a familiar lane by daylight. He knew every twist and turn as a mother knows the face of her child, and he seemed to be in a hurry. He jerked poor little Thibault possibly a trifle more ruthlessly than necessary even at the pace Bukawai set. But the old witch-doctor, an outcast from the society of man, diseased, shunned, hated, feared, was far from possessing an angelic temper. Nature had given him few of the kindlier characteristics of man, and these few fate had eradicated entirely. Shrewd, cunning, cruel, vindictive was Bukawai, the witch-doctor. Frightful tales were whispered of the cruel tortures he inflicted upon his victims. Children were frightened into obedience by the threat of his name. Often had Thibault been thus frightened, and now he was reaping a grisly harvest of terror from the seeds his mother had innocently sown. The darkness, the presence of the dreaded witch-doctor, the pain of the contusions with a haunting premonition of the future, and the fear of the hyenas combined to almost paralyze the child. He stumbled and reeled until Bukawai was dragging rather than leading him. Presently, Thibault saw a faint lightness ahead of them, and a moment later they emerged into a roughly circular chamber to which a little daylight filtered through a rift in the rocky ceiling. The hyenas were there ahead of them, waiting. As Bukawai entered with Thibault, the beasts slunk toward them, bearing yellow fangs. They were hungry. Toward Thibaut they came, and one snapped at his naked legs. Bukawai seized a stick from the floor of the chamber and struck a vicious blow at the beast, at the same time mumbling forth a volley of execrations. The hyena dodged and ran to the side of the chamber, where he stood growling. 
Bukawai took a step toward the creature, which bristled with rage at his approach. Fear and hatred shot from its evil eyes, but fortunately for Bukawai, fear predominated. Seeing that he was unnoticed, the second beast made a short, quick rush for Tebow. The child screamed and darted after the witch doctor, who now turned his attention to the second hyena. This one he reached with his heavy stick, striking it repeatedly and driving it to the wall. There the two carrion eaters commenced to circle the chamber, while the human carrion, their master, now in a perfect frenzy of demoniacal rage, ran to and fro in an effort to intercept them, striking out with his cudgel and lashing them with his tongue, calling down upon them the curses of whatever gods and demons he could summon to memory, and describing in lurid figures the ignominy of their ancestors. Several times one or the other of the beasts would turn to make a stand against the witch-doctor, and then Tebow would hold his breath in agonized terror, for never in his brief life had he seen such frightful hatred depicted upon the countenance of man or beast, but always fear overcame the rage of the savage creatures, so that they resumed their flight, snarling and bare-fanged, just at the moment that Tebow was certain they would spring at Bukawai's throat. At last the witch-doctor tired of the futile chase. With a snarl quite as bestial as those of the beast, he turned toward Tebow. I go to collect the ten fat goats, the new sleeping mat, and the two pieces of copper wire that your mother will pay for the medicine I shall make to bring you back to her. He said, You will stay here, there, and he pointed toward the passage which they had followed to the chamber. I will leave the hyenas. If you try to escape, they will eat you. He cast aside the stick and called to the beasts. They came, snarling and slinking, their tails between their legs. Bukawai led them to the passage and drove them into it. Then he dragged a rude lattice into the place before the opening after he himself had left the chamber. This will keep them from you, he said. If I do not get the ten fat goats and the other things, they shall at least have a few bones after I am through. And he left the boy to think over the meaning of his all too suggestive words. When he was gone, Tebow threw himself upon the earth floor and broke into childish sobs of terror and loneliness. He knew that his mother had no ten fat goats to give, and that when Bukawai returned, little Tebow would be killed and eaten. How long he lay there he did not know, but presently he was aroused by the growling of the hyenas. They had returned through the passage and were glaring at him from beyond the lattice. He could see their yellow eyes blazing through the darkness. They reared up and clawed at the barrier. Tebow shivered and withdrew to the opposite side of the chamber. He saw the lattice sag and sway to the attacks of the beasts. Momentarily he expected that it would fall inward, letting the creatures upon him. Wearily the horror-ridden hours dragged their slow way. Night came, and for a time Tebow slept, but it seemed that the hungry beasts never slept. Always they stood just beyond the lattice, growling their hideous growls or laughing their hideous laughs. Through the narrow rift in the rocky roof above him, Tebow could see a few stars, and once the moon crossed. At last daylight came again. Tebow was very hungry and thirsty, for he had not eaten since the morning before, and only once upon the long march had he been permitted to drink, but even hunger and thirst were almost forgotten in the terror of his position. It was after daylight that the child discovered a second opening in the walls of the subterranean chamber, almost opposite that at which the hyena still stood glaring hungrily at him. It was only a narrow slit in the rocky wall. It might lead in but a few feet, or it might lead to freedom. Tebow approached it and looked within. He could see nothing. He extended his arm into the blackness, but he dared not venture farther. Bukawai never would have left open a way of escape, Tebow reasoned, so this passage must lead either nowhere or to some still more hideous danger. 
To the boy's fear of the actual dangers which menaced him, Bukawai and the two hyenas, his superstition added countless others quite too horrible even to name, for in the lives of the blacks, through the shadows of the jungle day and the black horrors of the jungle night, flit strange, fantastic shapes peopling the already hideously peopled forests with menacing figures, as though the lion and the leopard, the snake and the hyena, and the countless poisonous insects were not quite sufficient to strike terror to the hearts of the poor, simple creatures whose lot is cast in earth's most fearsome spot. And so it was that little Thibault cringed not only from real menaces, but from imaginary ones. He was afraid even to venture upon a road that might lead to escape, lest Pukawai had set to watch it some frightful demon of the jungle. But the real menaces suddenly drove the imaginary ones from the boy's mind, for with the coming of daylight the half-famished hyenas renewed their efforts to break down the frail barrier which kept them from their prey. Rearing upon their hind feet, they clawed and struck at the lattice. With wide eyes, Thibaut saw it sag and rock. Not for long, he knew, could it withstand the assaults of these two powerful and determined brutes. Already one corner had been forced past the rocky protuberance of the entranceway, which had held it in place. A shaggy forearm protruded into the chamber. Thibaut trembled as with ague, for he knew that the end was near. Backing against the farther wall, he stood flattened out as far from the beasts as he could get. He saw the lattice give still more. He saw a savage, snarling head forced past it, and grinning jaws snapping and gaping toward him. In another instant the pitiful fabric would fall inward, and the two would be upon him, rending his flesh from his bones, gnawing the bones themselves, fighting for possession of his entrails. Bukawai came upon Mamaya outside the palisade of Mbonga the chief. At sight of him the woman drew back in revulsion, and then she flew at him, tooth and nail, but Bukawai, threatening her with a spear, held her at a safe distance. "'Where is my baby?' she cried. "'Where is my little Thibaut?' Bukawai opened his eyes in well-simulated amazement. "'Your baby!' he exclaimed. "'What should I know of him other than that I rescued him from the white god of the jungle and have not yet received my pay?' I come for the goats and the sleeping mat and the piece of copper wire the length of a tall man's arm from the shoulder to the tips of his fingers. Awful of a hyena, shrieked Mamaya. My child has been stolen and you, rotting fragment of a man, have taken him. Return him to me or I shall tear your eyes from your head and feed your heart to the wild hogs. Bukawai shrugged his shoulders. What do I know about your child? he asked. I have not taken him. If he is stolen again, what should Bukawai know of the matter? Did Bukawai steal him before? No, the white jungle god stole him, and if he stole him once he would steal him again. It is nothing to me. I returned him to you before, and I have come for my pay. If he is gone and you would have him returned, Bukawai will return him. For ten fat goats, a new sleeping mat, and two pieces of copper wire, the length of a tall man's arm from the shoulder to the tips of his fingers. And Bukawai will say nothing more about the goats and the sleeping mat and the copper wire which you were to pay for the first medicine. Ten fat goats, screamed Mamaya. I could not pay you ten fat goats in as many years. Ten fat goats indeed? Ten fat goats, repeated Bukawai. Ten fat goats, the new sleeping mat, and two pieces of copper wire the length of... Mamaya stopped him with an impatient gesture. Wait, she cried. I have no goats. You waste your breath. Stay here while I go to my man. He has but three goats, yet something may be done. Wait. Bukawai sat down beneath a tree. He felt quite content, for he knew that he should have either payment or revenge. He did not fear harm at the hands of these people of another tribe, although he well knew that they must fear and hate him. His leprosy alone would prevent their laying hands upon him, while his reputation as a witch-doctor rendered him doubly immune from attack. 
he was planning upon compelling them to drive the ten goats to the mouth of his cave when Mamaya returned. With her were three warriors, Mbonga the chief, Rabakega the village witch-doctor, and Ibeto, Tibo's father. They were not pretty men, even under ordinary circumstances, and now, with their faces marked by anger, they might well have inspired terror in the heart of anyone. But if Bukawai felt any fear, he did not betray it. Instead, he greeted them with an insolent stare, intended to awe them, as they came and squatted in a semicircle before him. Where is Ibeto's son? asked Mbonga. How should I know? returned Bukawai. Doubtless the white devil god has him. If I am paid, I will make strong medicine, and then we shall know where is Ibeto's son, and shall get him back again. It was my medicine which got him back the last time, for which I got no pay. I have my own witch doctor to make medicine, replied Mbonga with dignity. Bukawai sneered and rose to his feet. Very well, he said. Let him make his medicine and see if he can bring Ibeto's son back. He took a few steps away from them, and then he turned angrily back. His medicine will not bring the child back, that I know, and I also know that when you find him it will be too late for any medicine to bring him back, for he will be dead. This have I just found out, the ghost of my father's sister but now came to me and told me. Now Mbonga and Rabakiga might not take much stock in their own magic, and they might even be sceptical as to the magic of another, but there was always a chance of something being in it, especially if it were not their own. Was it not well known that old Bukawai had speech with demons themselves, and that two even lived with him in the forms of hyenas? Still, they must not exceed too hastily. There was the price to be considered, and Umbonga had no intention of parting lightly with ten goats to obtain the return of a single little boy who might die of smallpox long before he reached a warrior's estate. Wait said Mbonga. Let us see some of your magic, that we may know if it be good magic. And then we can talk about payment. Rabba Kigo will make some magic too. We will see who makes the best magic. Sit down, Bukoi. The payment will be ten goats, fat goats, a new sleeping mat and two pieces of copper wire, the length of a tall man's arm from the shoulder to the ends of his fingers, and it will be made in advance the goats being driven to my cave. Then will I make the medicine, and on the second day the boy will be returned to his mother. It cannot be done more quickly than that, because it takes time to make such strong medicine. Make us some medicine now, said Umbonga. Let us see what sort of medicine you make. Bring me fire, replied Bukawai, and I will make you a little magic. Mumaya was dispatched for the fire, and while she was away, Mbonga dickered with Bukawai about the price. Ten goats, he said, was a high price for an able-bodied warrior. He also called Bukawai's attention to the fact that he, Mbonga, was very poor, and that his people were very poor, and that ten goats were at least eight too many, to say nothing of a new sleeping mat and the copper wire, but Bukawai was adamant. His medicine was very expensive, and he would have to give at least five goats to the gods who helped him make it. They were still arguing when Mamaya returned with the fire. Bukawai placed a little on the ground before him, took a pinch of powder from a pouch at his side, and sprinkled it on the embers. A cloud of smoke rose with a puff. Bukawai closed his eyes and rocked back and forth, and then he made a few passes in the air and pretended to swoon. Umbonga and the others were much impressed. Rabakiga grew nervous. He saw his reputation waning. There was some fire left in the vessel which Mamaya had brought. He seized the vessel, dropped a handful of dry leaves into it while no one was watching, and then uttered a frightful scream which drew the attention of Bukawai's audience to him. It also brought Bukawai quite miraculously out of his swoon, but when the old witch-doctor saw the reason for the disturbance, he quickly relapsed into unconsciousness before anyone discovered his faux pas. 
Rabba Kiga, seeing that he had the attention of Umbonga, Ibeto, and Mamaya, blew suddenly into the vessel with the result that the leaves commenced to smolder and smoke issued from the mouth of the receptacle. Rabba Kiga was careful to hold it so that none might see the dry leaves. Their eyes opened wide at this remarkable demonstration of the village witch-doctor's powers. The latter, greatly elated, let himself out. He shouted, jumped up and down, and made frightful grimaces, and then he put his face close over the mouth of the vessel and appeared to be communing with the spirits within. It was while he was thus engaged that Bukawai came out of his trance, his curiosity finally having got the better of him. No one was paying him the slightest attention. He blinked his one eye angrily, then he too let out a loud roar, and when he was sure that Mbonga had turned toward him, he stiffened rigidly and made spasmodic movements with his arms and legs. "'I see him,' he cried. "'He is far away. The white devil god did not get him. He is alone and in great danger, but,' he added, "'if the ten fat goats and the other things are paid to me quickly, there is yet time to save him.' Rabba Kiga had paused to listen. Mbonga looked toward him. The chief was in a quandary. He did not know which medicine was the better. "'What does your magic tell you?' he asked of Rabba Kiga. "'I, too, see him,' screamed Rabba Kiga. "'But he is not where Bukowai says he is. He is dead at the bottom of the river.' At this, Mamaya commenced to howl loudly. Tarzan had followed the spoor of the old man, the two hyenas, and the little black boy to the mouth of the cave in the rocky canyon between the two hills. Here he paused a moment before the sampling barrier which Bukawai had set up, listening to the snarls and growls which came faintly from the far recesses of the cavern. Presently, mingled with the beastly cries, there came faintly to the keen ears of the ape-man the agonized moan of a child. No longer did Tarzan hesitate. Hurling the door aside, he sprang into the dark opening. Narrow and black was the corridor, but long use of his eyes in the Stygian blackness of the jungle nights had given to the ape-man something of the nocturnal visionary powers of the wild things with which he had consorted since babyhood. He moved rapidly and yet with caution, for the place was dark, unfamiliar and winding. As he advanced, he heard more and more loudly the savage snarls of the two hyenas, mingled with the scraping and scratching of their paws upon wood. The moans of a child grew in volume, and Tarzan recognized in them the voice of the little black boy he once had sought to adopt as his baloo. There was no hysteria in the ape-man's advance. Too accustomed was he to the passing of life in the jungle to be greatly wrought even by the death of one whom he knew but the lust for battle spurred him on. He was only a wild beast at heart, and his wild beast's heart beat high in anticipation of conflict. In the rocky chamber of the hill's centre, little Thibaut crouched low against the wall as far from the hunger-crazed beasts as he could drag himself. He saw the lattice giving to the frantic clawing of the hyenas. He knew that in a few minutes his little life would flicker out horribly beneath the rending yellow fangs of those loathsome creatures. Beneath the buffetings of the powerful bodies, the lattice sagged inward until, with a crash, it gave way, letting the carnivora in upon the boy. Thibaut cast one affrighted glance toward them, and then closed his eyes and buried his face in his arms, sobbing piteously. For a moment the hyenas paused, caution and cowardice holding them from their prey. They stood thus glaring at the lad, then slowly, stealthily crouching, they crept toward him. It was thus that Tarzan came upon them, bursting into the chamber swiftly and silently, but not so silently that the keen-eared beast did not note his coming. With angry growls they turned from Thibaut upon the ape-man as, with a smile upon his lips, he ran toward them. For an instant one of the animals stood its ground, but the ape-man did not deign even to draw his hunting-knife against the despised Dango. 
Running in upon the brute, he grasped it by the scruff of the neck, just as it attempted to dodge past him, and hurled it across the cavern after its fellow, which already was slinking into the corridor bent upon escape. Then Tarzan picked Thibaut from the floor, and when the child felt human hands upon him instead of the paws and fangs of the hyenas, he rolled his eyes upward in surprise and incredulity, and as they fell upon Tarzan, sobs of relief broke from the childish lips, and his hands clutched at his deliverer as though the white devil god was not the most feared of jungle creatures. When Tarzan came to the cave mouth, the hyenas were nowhere in sight, and after permitting Thibaut to quench his thirst in the spring which rose nearby, he lifted the boy to his shoulders and set off toward the jungle at a rapid trot, determined to still the annoying howlings of Mamaya as quickly as possible, for he shrewdly had guessed that the absence of her baloo was the cause of her lamentation. "'He is not dead at the bottom of the river,' cried Bukawai. "'What does this fellow know about making magic? "'Who is he anyway that he dare say Bukawai's magic is not good magic? "'Bukawai sees Mamaya's son. "'He is far away and alone in great danger. "'Hasten, then, with the ten fat goats, the—' "'But he got no further.' There was a sudden interruption from above, from the branches of the very tree beneath which they squatted, and as the five blacks looked up, they almost swooned in fright as they saw the great white devil god looking down upon them. But before they could flee, they saw another face, that of the lost little Tebow, and his face was laughing and very happy. And then Tarzan dropped fearlessly among them, the boy still upon his back, and deposited him before his mother. Mumaya, Ebeto, Rabakiga, and Umbonga were all crowding around the lad, trying to question him at the same time. Suddenly Mumaya turned ferociously to fall upon Bukawai, for the boy had told her all that he had suffered at the hands of the cruel old man, but Bukawai was no longer there. He had required no recourse to black art to assure him that the vicinity of Mumaya would be no healthful place for him after Thibaut had told his story, and now he was running through the jungle as fast as his old legs would carry him toward the distant lair where he knew no black would dare pursue him. Tarzan, too, had vanished, as he had a way of doing, to the mystification of the blacks. And then Mamaya's eyes lighted upon Rabakiga. The village witch-doctor saw something in those eyes of hers which boded no good to him, and backed away. So my Thibaut is dead at the bottom of the river, is he? The woman shrieked. And he's far away and alone in great danger, is he? Magic? The scorn which Mamaya crowded into that single word would have done credit to a thespian of the first magnitude. Magic, indeed, she screamed. Mamaya will show you some magic of her own. And with that she seized upon a broken limb and struck Rabaki got across the head. With a howl of pain, the man turned and fled, Mamaya pursuing him and beating him across the shoulders, through the gateway and up the length of the village street, to the intense amusement of the warriors, the women and the children who were so fortunate as to witness the spectacle, for one and all feared Rabakiga, and to fear is to hate. Thus it was that to his host of passive enemies, Tarzan of the Apes added that day two active foes, both of whom remained awake long into the night planning means of revenge upon the white devil god who had brought them into ridicule and disrepute. But with their most malevolent schemings was mingled a vein of real fear and awe that would not down. Young Lord Greystoke did not know that they planned against him, nor, knowing, would have cared. He slept as well that night as he did on any other night, and though there was no roof above him and no doors to lock against intruders, he slept much better than his noble relative in England, who had eaten altogether too much lobster and drunk too much wine at dinner that night.